Alrighty, here we go. So we're going to continue on with integration, obviously, because it says integration right there. But we're going to talk about something called a definite integral. So before we do that, let's review a little bit. We have done integrals already, also known as antiderivatives. But you'll remember that each one of those times we did an antiderivative, we ended up with a function. So if we took the antiderivative of x cubed, we got 1 fourth x to the fourth plus c. A function gave us another function. Now the rules change. We learned yesterday, or not yes, but last class, excuse me, that if we take an integral, that integral represents the area under the curve. And so that's going to start to generate numbers for us. And we approximated those numbers by doing a bunch of rectangles. Okay? So that gets us up to date. Now what we're going to start doing is calculating more exact values for that area under the curve. So now our antiderivative or our integral doesn't give us another function, it gives us a numerical value. Okay, we're good? Beautiful. Okay, so we're going to talk about something called the Riemann sum. Riemann was a, um, a mathematician who came up with one simple idea, which I'll get to when, we, uh, when, when it's appropriate, but he's historically famous because he asked one simple question, which I'll get to later. Okay, we're going to talk about a Riemann sum. As I mentioned, we're going to uh, talk about definite, inter definite integrals as limits. There is an analogy with derivatives. You'll remember when we did derivatives, we had that big, ugly difference quotient with a limit in front of it. We played with that for a while, and then it went away. The same thing is true here. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but it is the conceptual part of the lesson that I want to talk with you about. Um, then we're going to talk about all the properties associated with definite integrals. Those are easy. And then, of course, you're going to use some mad geometry skills to solve most of the problems on the homework tonight, okay? which hopefully won't be that difficult. Okay, so Riemann sums. Okay, so Riemann asked a simple question, and that was he's doing these integrals. He's breaking them into rectangles. He's realizing, like we talked about the other day, that you can shrink the size of the rectangles to get a more accurate answer. And then he asked a simple question. Why do all the rectangles have to be the same size? Okay. And the answer is they don't. And so he went on to do something like this. Okay. Now, I know there's a lot of wasted space here, but it's illustrating what Riemann worked with. Okay. He said, depending on the shape, why can't I change the sizes of the rectangles? And he created this formula up on top, this, as it says, weird notation. And I want to break each of those parts down for you because this is what brings the concept that Riemann eventually came up with. Okay, so what does the sigma do? I know you've seen that in other classes. What is the, the sigma is that giant capital E looking thing for those of you that don't know. What does that do or what does it mean mathematically? Does anybody know? Adds up all the sums of Good. the function. Good. It adds up everything. Okay. F of C, oh here, I got some stuff here, okay? First of all, delta X is the width of the rectangle. We talked about that the other day, that's easy. F of C I is the height of one rectangle. So you pick some value C I, it's your initial uh, location, you calculate the height, it's just like we did the other day. Width times height gives you the area of the rectangle. Then the sigma is gonna add up all the areas of the rectangles. Okay, so this is just a different way of writing what we did already on Wednesday. Okay. Are we ever going to see this sigma notation again? Probably not. Maybe in some conceptual things, but definitely not in a calculation type problem. Okay, so again, Riemann said, well, why do we have to make all the rectangles the same size? And you don't if you realize how you're going to handle the problem. And this is, just asking this simple question didn't necessarily make him famous. What made him famous was the work that he did after that. Okay, and this is where it gets a little, uh, a little weird conceptually. So there's a lot going on here. Let me, let me stop with that. Okay, so we said the other day that if we shrink the width of the rectangles, we would get a more accurate answer. Or you could do the same thing by increasing the number of rectangles. Okay, everybody's with me on that, right? All right, good. So now Riemann says, well, wait, let's make them all different sizes. What I would eventually like to do to get the most accurate answer is I want my rectangles to be infinitely skinny. 
And so if they're infinitely skinny, there's an infinitely large number of rectangles. So this rectangle, the green one, looks like it's about two units wide. If I shrink that down, a lot of this wasted space above will disappear. The same is true with any of the other rectangles. So our goal then to get the most accurate answer is to shrink them down to almost a width of zero, which sounds a lot like a limit. If all the rectangles are the same width, that's really easy. You know, we go from two to one to a half to a fourth and all the way down to zero. So what Riemann said was, okay, I've got all these different rectangles. If you look at this example, for instance, a yellow, a blue, a green, and a red. The green is the biggest rectangle. And so he said, okay, I'm gonna shrink these but none of them matter except the biggest, fattest one. If I shrink the fattest one down to zero, then all the others are also gonna be down to zero. Okay, does that concept make sense? Find the biggest rectangle, shrink them all down, but as long as you shrink this biggest one down to zero, they've all gone down to zero. Okay, so some notation. He called his interval a partition and labeled it as delta. And then he came up with this notation, this delta with a double absolute value bar on it, and he called that the norm. That's the largest width of any of the rectangles. So if we come back here to this picture, this would be my norm. Because that's the widest rectangle. Okay? And so he said... If I want an exact answer, not the approximations we did the other day, but an exact answer for the area under the curve, I need to shrink the fattest rectangle down to zero. So the sigma notation means all the rectangles. I find the fattest one, I shrink them all. As long as the fattest one goes to zero, all the others have gone to zero. We have an infinite number of rectangles and we have the exact area under the curve. Okay, breather for a second, questions? No? Good. Why does it, like just because you make the bigger one smaller, why does it make all the other ones smaller? Um, think about these things shrinking at the same rate. Okay. So, okay. so as they shrink at the same rate, if they're getting smaller and smaller, by the time the fattest one gets to zero, all the others have already gone to zero. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? This is all just the conceptual stuff. We're not really gonna do any work with this, but I want you to understand where this comes from. And now that we've talked about that, what's gonna happen in later problems is any problem involving rectangles is just gonna be referred to as a Riemann sum. Sometimes Riemann sums will have the same width rectangles Sometimes they'll have different size rectangles, but all of those rectangles get thrown into a Riemann sum problem. Okay, so we're good. Now we're making that transition. The transition is from approximate answers, like we did the other day, to now I want exact answers. Approximate is not good enough. This is going to give me an exact answer. And that exact answer is what's called a definite integral. And we're going to start small with this. We're going to do some really easy calculations. But before we do the easy calculations, we need some notation. And so we get this puppy. The left-hand side of this equal sign is the Riemann sum definition of the exact area under the curve. <clears throat> I don't ever want to see that ever again because you can, I mean, I think you all appreciate it. it's ridiculous. The right-hand side of that equation, we're going to use ad nauseum. And notice it looks familiar, except all of a sudden this A and B thing pops up. Okay, those are called our limits of integration. You know A and B already. A, and B, A is our starting point, B is our ending point. So this notation on the right is saying, find the area under the curve, find the exact area under the curve from A to B. Uh, a is called the lower limit, B is called the upper limit because it's on the lower part. B is on the upper, lower limit, upper limit.
And notice we haven't talked about mechanics yet. We haven't talked about what this means or how to use it. Not yet. That is, that's actually going to come after break. We're going to cheat a little bit today. Okay, is everybody with me? Am I going too fast or are we good? We're good? Okay, let's talk about some properties then. We see the same properties that we've seen when we did limits, when we did logs. Well, we didn't do logs, but when you've done logs. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's just like the derivatives also. The integral of a sum is the sum of the integrals. The integral of a difference is the difference of the integrals. We're not going to do that much. We're just going to calculate the integral. But that is the property. Uh, constant rule. If I want to take the antiderivative of 2x cubed, I can just move the 2 out in front and multiply it at the end. It's the same thing we did with derivatives. Okay, we learned how to take the derivative of x squared. If I stuck, stuck a 7 in front of it, technically what we did is put the 7 out in front, found the derivative of x squared, and multiplied them. Same thing is true here. This one's new. Why is the antiderivative from a to a equal to zero? Anyone? Bueller? Because the area under the area under the function region from A to A, there is no area, so it has to be zero. Perfect. Yep. Good. Another way to look at it is the rectangle has no width. Therefore, its area is zero. Okay. Uh, let's see. Notice, no product and, and quotient here. Okay. The product, the, the integral of a product is not the product of the integrals. Okay. So stay away from that. Uh, okay, what does this guy mean? Okay, this one helps to explain with a picture. Let's suppose I have a function and I want to find the area under the curve from A to B. I'm going to do the definite integral which will give me the exact area of that thing. What this says is, oh, let's take this point C. We'll put C right here. C is somewhere between A and B, and therefore, I can just calculate the area of this part, calculate the area of that part, and add them up. Okay, when you see a picture, it's a little bit easier to understand. Why would you ever do that? Most of the time, you're not going to, but we will play with that a little bit when we do some piecewise functions and that kind of stuff. More than likely, we're probably going to go this way more so than we are going to go this way. Instead of splitting a, a region into two regions, we're probably going to take two regions and put them together into one. And then one last one. What if I screw up and I switch the upper limit and the lower limit? That's okay. Just put it back as long as you put a minus sign in front of it. Okay, so if I'm doing an integral from 2 to 3 of f of x dx, and it's given to me upside down 3 to 2 f of x dx, you can fix it by just putting a minus sign in front of it. Okay. In other words, anytime you switch the limits of integration, you got to multiply it by negative one. We're good? Any problems so far? Okay, good. I have a very simple problem for you. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because we're going to do this later, but it's the answer that I want to get to, okay? So bear with me. I'm giving you this information. If I take the definite integral from 2 to 4 of the function x cubed, the answer is 60. You'll have to trust me on that. And in a couple weeks, you'll be able to do this on your own. 
The same is true for x and just plain old dx. There's the answers. I'm telling you what that is. So now I want to find the integral of this thing. I've got a nice cute little cubic there. And I want to find out the exact area under the curve of that cubic so I can break it into the parts, plug and chug, use the properties that we did before, and get this mess. Okay? You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out what I'm doing here. But what I did want to talk about is that negative answer. This is going to bother some of you. Welcome to calculus. What does that mean? That means that if I take this function, this cubic, and I graph it, when I calculate the area under the curve, I get a negative area. That's never happened before. In fact, when I work with my freshmen in geometry, that's a big no-no. You can never have a negative distance. You can never have a negative area. If you get a negative area, you made a mistake. In calculus, that rule goes out the window. Okay. But what does it mean? How do I get a negative area other than I just looked at this problem and, oh, look, the answer is negative? Well, there's a simple explanation. Anytime the area goes below the x-axis, that is considered negative area. Okay, just as a quick check for understanding, let's suppose, uh, let's suppose I did this, uh, negative pi over 2, pi over 2, of the sine of x, d, x. What does that equal? Zero. Good. Why? Because the positive area and the negative area cancel out. Excellent. This area is equal to this area. They're both the same. Now, what they are, I have no idea. I mean, I do. I'm not going to tell you, though. I have no idea, but they will cancel each other out, and you get zero. Okay. What we're going to talk about today is how to find this answer if I don't give you the picture. Okay. For some easy functions. Okay. So again, negative area is possible. Any values that end up below the x-axis are considered negative area. Here's some stuff you need to know from geometry, and I'm sure you all know how to find the area of a triangle. I'm sure you know how to find the area of a circle. And I'm pretty sure you know how to find the area of a trapezoid. If you don't, write those down. I also didn't list some of the other ones like squares and rectangles. Okay, so now here comes the easy part of the lesson. We're going to find definite integrals, i.e. area under the curves, by doing geometry. That's it. Okay? Are we ready? Mr. I have a question. Certainly. Okay, so when we're like calculating all this do we still have like extra area and then like, um, uh, what was it? Like I, overestimated and underestimated? No. That's a great question. No, we're done with that now. When we get to definite, when we get to the term definite integral, definite integral, I can't even talk. Definite integral implies that we're getting an exact area, no approximations. If you're going to get an approximate area, it will say something like, Use Riemann sums to approximate the area under the curve using five rectangles. Okay. Otherwise, we're doing this exact stuff now. And the exact stuff is going to get more difficult as time goes on, but just to give you an idea of what's going on, we're going to start with something basic. Okay? Good question. Any other questions? All right, let's do this. I've got three examples for you. And we're going to walk, th walk through each one of these separately. Uh, similar to the rectangles, if we draw a good picture, we're good to go. So let's start with part A. What does the graph of 4 look like? A horizontal line. 
horizontal line at y equals 4. Hot diggity. So what is the integral or the definite integral asking us? It's asking us what's the area under the curve of this horizontal line from 1 to 3. Wow. There we go. What's the answer? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Two times four. This is not a Riemann sum problem. It's just we happen to get a rectangle based on that graph. You see how we're doing this now. This isn't calculus where we're figuring out an antiderivative of four or an antiderivative of x plus two. We're drawing a picture and using our geometric knowledge to figure this out. Okay? There we go. All right, go back to number two. What's the graph of x plus two look like? There should not be such a... Uh, thank you. One. Say again, I'm sorry. Uh, y intercept at uh, zero, two, and then it's just a slope one. Okay, so sketch that in your notes and then tell me what shape is the area that we're looking for in this problem. Is it a trapezoid? It is a trapezoid. Well done. Bink, bink. Right there. For those of you that are having a hard time visualizing this, this trapezoid has base 1 over here, base 2 over here, and our delta x is the height. It's a trapezoid on its side. One half height times b1 plus b2. Number three, what's the graph of the square root of 4 minus x squared look like? Upside down quadratic, or sorry, parabola at y intercept of 0, 4. Nope. Because it's got a square root there. Oh, root. Yep, there's a root there. Anybody else? Is this a semicircle? It is a semicircle. The top, bottom, or left, or right? Alex? The top. Yes, it is the top. <laughs> Good. With a radius of what? Four. Two. Which one? <laughs> Which one? Which one? Two. Which one? One, one, one. One. Now you've changed to one. So now we have possible answers of one, two, or four. Anybody? Two. It's two, yeah. It's the square root of that number. Now, how do you know that? Well, go back to the equation of a circle. That's a plus or minus, by the way, okay? I'm assuming you could all find a semicircle. And in fact, this problem says going from negative two to two. So if we look at the picture there, we get that thing. What's the area of the semicircle from two to two? two sorry, from negative two to two. Okay, just for giggles, let's change this last problem a little bit. What if I asked you for this?
If I stuck a plus three on the end of that puppy, how would it affect the graph? Wouldn't you have a full circle then? No, but a good guess. Would it go up three? It? Yes, it would go up three. It would take that whole graph and move the whole thing up. So we would get something like this, where this would be at five, and my semicircle would be sitting there. However, notice we define the definite integral as the area from the curve down to the x-axis. So we'd have to add on to it this little rectangle below it. So all of this would be the area we're looking for. So it would be the semicircle plus the rectangle. That rectangle, by the way, is 4 by 3. So it would be 2 pi plus 12. Or, last option on this problem, what if I did this? Change that to a zero. Now we're just going from zero to two, so we'd be looking for this area, which would be half of that original area, just plain old pi. All right, so notice we're not doing a lot of calculus here. We're using some calculus notation but we're pretty much just doing geometry. Questions? I got one more example for you. The definite integral of the absolute value of x from negative 3 to 2. Any ideas? I assume you all know what the absolute value of x looks like, yes? If it's under the graph, would it be two triangles? Yes. Does that answer your question, Madison? Yeah. Very good. I'm going from negative three to two. So I would solve that problem. First of all, I graph the absolute value of x, which you know is that v looking thing. And then if you go from negative three to two, like Madison said, you've got two different triangles. Mine are pink and brown. Find the area of the pink rectangle, find the area of the brown rectangle, add them up. Even when we figure out how to do antiderivatives and we start doing calculus on this thing, we're never gonna take an antiderivative of absolute value of x or any variation of an absolute value. It's always gonna come down to a picture, just like we did with derivatives. Remember, we talked about derivatives of, that, derivatives of absolute value, but we never actually took a derivative. We cheated by drawing pictures and calculating slopes. Same thing is true here. Okay. Would the area be negative one? Nope, area is 6.5. Nothing below the x-axis here. All the areas are positive. Okay. Okay. Are we good? Okay, so this is kind of the uh, calm before the storm. The lesson um, for three point, or day 38, is it day 38? Day 39 is a little bit of conceptual stuff, understanding what Riemann sums are, and then geometry. Geometry, geometry, geometry. When we come back from break, we're gonna go back and look at problems like this, like these three, but we're actually gonna do some calculus. We're gonna calculate the antiderivative of this thing and figure out how to numerically calculate the area without having to draw a picture. Okay. But that's, that's a ways away. It's really important. It's so important, it's called the fundamental theorem of calculus, but we'll do that when we get back from break. Okay. We're good to go.